It is great to see you. And yes, next uh, Sunday is going to be uh, a really powerful Sunday to be here. So I really encourage you to uh, be here, invite friends. Uh, Seth uh, spoke about two weeks ago as one of the keynote speakers at the National Right for Life in Washington, D.C. And so uh, we're very privileged to have him. And uh, so talk to him on the phone this week, and it's going to be a powerful message and one that you do not want to miss. That being said, you don't want to miss this one either, right? Right? So we are in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21, going through 31. We'll split it up as we go along here. And I encourage you to just keep those Bibles open and follow along with me as we go. There was a gathering of friends at a pretty nice English estate that really nearly turned to tragedy when one of the children strayed out into deep water. You can kind of picture this, right? Maybe you've been there and seen something like this. The gardener heard cries for help, and he plunged in, and he rescued the drowning child. That drowning child's name was Winston Churchill. His grateful parents asked the gardener what they could do to reward him. And the gardener said, you know what? I, I wish my son could go to college someday and become a doctor. He is very gifted, and we can't afford that. And the Churchills said, we'll see to it. Years later, Churchill was the prime minister of England. He had pneumonia. And the country's best physician was summoned. His name was Dr. Alexander Fleming. Yes, if you know the name, he is the one that discovered, developed penicillin. He was also the son of that gardener. Churchill later said, Rarely has one man owed his life twice to the same person. Redemption is powerful. Can you say those words with me? Redemption is powerful. The gospel offers redemption by God. Well, what is redemption then? Redemption explains how God saves us. How does he? He paid a personal price. In real life, our sin leads us right into bondage. And, it, and there's no way out. We try, but I, everyone in this room would, get, would be with me and say, you know what, I've tried to get out of sin by myself and it doesn't work. We dig ourselves deeper. Every day, <laughs> we create the conditions in which we literally deserve to die, in which we literally deserve hell. But what does God do? He offers to get us out at his own expense. He offers to absorb within himself the consequences we set in motion. He pays the price so that we don't have to because we can't anyway. That's redemption. If you've sinned, and we're not going to do a, a raise of hands here, but if you have sinned, you've sinned your way into helplessness. You are in the deep water. You are in water that you cannot swim and get out of. You deserve to reap what you sow. But you can be redeemed. You can be saved. God is not only willing to pay the price, he already has. At the cross, with Christ. You enter into redemption freely by his grace. If you jump down to verse 27 of the section of scripture we're looking at, it says Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. That's where he wants to take us. Through the conviction of sin into repentance, we there experience redemption. And Isaiah 21, 31 falls really into two categories, two sections. In the first few verses, 21 through 26, the prophet laments our corruption. He asks what? What we have become and what, what does God do with 
people like us. He shows us both our corruption and, and God's redeeming purpose. And verse 21, right, what, is, what does he say there? How the faithful city has become a harlot. She who was full of justice, righteousness once lodged in her, but now murderers. You see verse 26 that resolves that tension. If you jump down there, therefore the Lord of God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel declares, I, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself of those that are my foes. That, that, that's that redemption. And then verses 27 through 31, the prophet really asks how. How does God do that? And we have to understand that verses 21 through 26 stand back and envision the whole sweep of history. Looking at the disasters of the Old Testament followers of God through the failures even of the modern day church. And Isaiah foresees this faithful city of God, Revelation 21, 22. And, and verses 27 through 31 speak directly to every successive generation along the way. And we face a decision. Will we choose to enter the redemptive ways of God? Isaiah's aim there is to sober us into who we are. Give us hope in who God is. Urge us with an unblinking realism about how we need to experience redemption. So this vision is both beautiful and terrible. It's terrible and beautiful. Let's dig in where he starts with our corruption. Verse 21. How the faithful city has become a harlot. She who was full of justice. Righteousness once lodged in her, but now murderers. Your, your silver has become dross. You drink dilute, your drink diluted with water. One of the things that we need to understand as Christians and remember, it's constantly said through the New Testament that the church is the bride of Christ. And thus, Christian believers are, are essentially engaged to be married to Jesus, as 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 3 explains. This love that we have with him and him with us is passionate, and it's best explained in a marital love, and that's assuming you know a true marital love that is that is right and pure in God's eyes. But that's how it's best explained. And Jesus is claiming us for himself alone. We are the bride of Christ. Jesus isn't just flirting with us. We, we need to be longing for the day that he will present himself to us in full splendor. And that marriage feast that happens. But right now, what the prophet sees here and what we have to acknowledge is going on is that we form other loyalties. We commit spiritual adultery. Hosea chapters 1 through 3. And that's why the word how stands out at the beginning of verse 21. That same word begins another book, Lamentations. It, it signals that these verses here of Isaiah are a lament. Something heartbreaking has gone on here. Martin Lloyd-Jones said about this section of Scripture and trying to understand it, every institution tends to produce its opposite. Again and again, we produce the opposite of what God wants. When we are not full of justice, modeling the human life that God has called us to, the way life is meant to be, as we were talking about on Thursday night in Deuteronomy 22, maintaining the God distinctions that he has put together, 
we hear a heart cry. A heart cry of sorrow from heaven. And when you look at the second part of verse 21 there, righteousness once lodged in her, but now murderers. The Hebrew word implies that in this world, righteousness is like a lonely traveler in hostile surroundings. In Israel's forefathers, righteousness once was welcome. That, that's what that's getting there. Righteousness once lodged in her. But by the time things were written here, it was changing. It had changed. Have you ever been in a neighborhood for a long time and have noticed when it went bad? Have, you, have anyone ever experienced that? I grew up in this one section of Phoenix that was actually a really nice section of Phoenix. And whenever I've gone back over the years, it is amazing to me how I would sit there and go, I would never live in that place. It was, it was, it's awful. It's awful. And that's, that's the picture that we get here. The spiritual neighborhood had gone bad. Why? Well, because unfaithfulness to, to God destroys the bonds that hold his people together. But now, murderers. And we have a New Testament equivalent of that statement in 1 John 3, verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is what? A murderer. I mean, Keep going on here in verse 22. Your silver has become dross. Your, your drink diluted with water. Yes, sin, it, it promises to spice up our lives, but it dilutes everything. Listen to this person's understanding of, the, of a difference between good and evil. This person said in an article a few years ago. Nothing is so beautiful, nothing is so continually fresh and surprising, so full of sweet and perpetual ecstasy as good. No deserts are so dreary, monotonous, and boring as evil. But with fantasy, it's the other way around. Fictional good is boring and flat, while fictional evil is intriguing, attractive, and full of charm. Where are you living? Are you living in reality or are you making something up? We need God to tell us the truth. We need God to tell us the truth of our dreariness. And actually, we will then experience peace when we are redeemed. And Isaiah then moves into contrasting the influence of man with the intervention of God in verses 23 and 24, really about these re rebellious leaders that are there and the, the mighty Lord. Verse 23, your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and, and chases after rewards. They do not defend the orphan nor does the widow's plea come before them? Therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, ah, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself on my foes. And what we get here is an understanding that salvation is also a community experience. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the community is saved and going to heaven. But it means that leadership is involved in this process, which creates a level of responsibility to one another in the world we live in. The, the ancient Jewish paraphrase of the Old Testament called Tergum shows how verse 23 can work in real life. It says this, All of them love to accept a bribe, saying, A man to his neighbor, assist me in my case, so I will repay you in your case. Well, let's go to actual scripture in Exodus 23, 8. 
you shall not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of the just. Today, you know what the phrase is for that? Think about it. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And that, unfortunately, is how the gears of everyday life are lubricated in our world today, right? We have to admit that. It gets things done, albeit wrong. And it, then it overrides justice. No matter how well it works, when responsible people choose expect to, uh, to, to make things fast, to get things through by taking bribes, doing all these different things, things like that, they become auctioneers. You know what they're auctioning today? Truth. Truth is being auctioned. We have this incredible gap between what is true and what is not. But there's people out there trying to sell truth, but they're actually lying in it. And, for example, so many people sit there and go, well, why do not, you know, why do so many people not trust pharmaceutical companies? Well, I'll tell you why. The largest fine in criminal history, criminal justice history, was received just a little over 10 years ago by Pfizer. Does that name sound familiar? They paid almost $3 billion, with a B, in fines. Why? Because they lied about a drug and its effectiveness. And they didn't release the stats that were true. Today, they have 74 years before they have to relieve, uh, release the stats of the thing that they're doing now. And then you sit there and you go, well, why do people not trust them? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That's why helpless people get stepped on. That's why powerful people lose any sense of a moral compass. You see, what happens is all they care about, all when sin enters the camp, you just care about yourself. You care about the bottom line of profit. You care about everything but really caring about people. It becomes savage. Do you feel like it's savage in our culture today? Man, it feels savage. I'm saying all of that to say, this sounds familiar. This sounds familiar. What happens, everyone, is if people really do not believe there is a God, if people believe that they are God, if they believe that the that no one really cares about the hairs of their head being numbered. They don't think there's a God that actually knows that type of detail. There's then no logical reason for them to care about anyone else if they feel that way. I get it. That's why the most important for, thing for us is to understand what do we know about God? Who is God? And to understand that God understands that. And he says in verse 24, very clearly, the mighty one of Israel declares, Ah, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself of my foes. To his glory, no matter what we do, God's not going to go away. God is never going to un-God himself. He is the Lord in heaven. The Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, who cares deeply about offended justice. And his commitment to his own people is our hope. His commitment as Christ, as the husband of the church. What is his commitment to us? No one's going to mess with my bride. 
don't mess with my bride. I will blow you apart. And that should give us hope. He will get the relief from the enemies. He will avenge himself. Nobody is getting away with anything. Redemption also will never be defeated. And after these charges in verse 23 and 24 that sound like they were written yesterday. God's resolution there in 24, you kind of expect him to get the bat out of my office and swing it at everyone. Just total annihilation. I want you to repeat three more words with me. Redemption is surprising. Redemption is surprising. Write write that down. Because in verse 26, verse 25, 26, let's start with 25. I will also turn my hand against you. It sounds like it. It sounds like that bat's coming, right? And I will smelt away your dross as with lye, and I will remove all your alloy. Then I will restore. I want you to circle those words if you do this in your Bible. I will turn, I will restore. Just hang on to those. I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. You know what God's doing here? Our wonderful ministry associate, Daniel, works at a company that cleans up stuff. God is using industrial strength cleansing agents here. Lie, as with lie, to remove deep stains of our long-standing, well-established sins. He's able to recreate our lost purity. He takes his people into a refining fire all the way through to restoration as a faithful city. The people of God at their best will be seen again and we can and we will be a part of it. Malachi 3.3, he will sit as a smelter and purify of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. The Hebrew text here does something that's interesting. Those words, I will turn, I will restore, are actually the same word. We, in our English verbs, have to use turn and restore in order for our brains in English to make sense. But Isaiah is implying something very important here. God is acting in one way. He's not doing two things. He's acting in one way. He's able to accomplish two things at once. When God turns his hand against us, it isn't a disaster. It's an act of restoration. The the discipline of God achieves just what he intends. Purification, restoration, both at the same time. We can expect the goodness of God to, to show up in unlikely places. When he turns his hand against us to purify us, let's trust him to do something. Let's trust him to restore us. Verses 27 through 31 conclude this passage, but not with some cutesy ending of a, ending of a cheesy movie. You know how it goes where restorations happen and everyone's, oh, oh this is sappy. And me as a guy, I walk away like that's just stupid. No. It's hard hitting here. See, we have to remember, why are we here? 
Why are these words here in this section? Isaiah doesn't want us to misunderstand anything. He has been saying that God's going to restore his people. The church's glory is not passing. It's, it, her corruption will be passing. Do you catch that? The church's glory is not passing. The corruption will be passing. In our generation right now, think about it. How can we be redeemed out of our failures? Isaiah wants, to know, wants us to know that. He wants us to feel the weight of the decision that is before us, that we face. God is going to purify his bride, the church. And in verses 27 through 31, we will need to dare to follow. Because we're following him into a refining fire. And we've got to be able... <laughs> I, I, I went camping a lot as a kid. And there was always this dare that was out there. How close could you get to the campfire without feeling the heat or tolerating it? And you would, you know, you try to get, yeah, I see some guys, I remember this. You, you, you get your sneaker there or your shoe there and how close can you get there and how long could it stay? And maybe I could put my shoe in some of the, the uh, coals real fast. Anyone else ever? kind of mess that yeah and, and the whole thing was not to stay there too long right if you stayed there too long first of all your parents would get upset because the bottom of your shoe was melted and no longer useful but it was this game we played and we've got to be different here because this is a refining fire that we're going to be reading about here. And we've got to stay long enough for the purpose to be fulfilled in us to be refined. There's no playing with the fire. It's going through it and letting God refine us. Verse 27, Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. But transgressors and sinners will be crushed together and those who forsake the Lord will come to an end. You see, we've got to remember that God does not redeem us by casually sweeping his standards aside. Man, doesn't that seem like what so many people want to do right now? It's like, uh, you know, I get that these things are in the Bible and I get he wants us to live a certain way, but we're just not going to talk about that. Well, we need to because God pays the price demanded by his own justice and righteousness. God pays the price. This is the magnitude of his achievement at the cross of Christ. Redemption does not come by God's leniency. It actually comes by his justice. It actually comes by his righteousness fully satisfied in Christ. That's why Titus 2, 13 and 14 is so important to remember in a situation like this. Our great God and Savior Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. We are redeemed at a cost. Amen? We are redeemed at a cost by God, to God, that we will never fully understand. At the cross, God put the real moral guilt of all sinners of all time on Christ. I can't even begin to fathom that. And when you hear the words of Christ, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? The weight of every sin of mankind, past, present, and future, bam! On the perfect sacrifice, the perfect substitute, 
See, God wasn't lenient at all, was he? God honored his own moral government of the universe. Our part then, Isaiah tells us, is to do something to repent. Is to repent. How, how could we do anything else? We really add no value of, to Jesus' sacrifice in our sinful state. But his love does claim all that we are. See, the flip side of God paying the price is that we're no longer our own. What else could we do but repent? We, we need to repent of our sins every day. We need to repent of our fifth-rate righteousness that we try to have every day. We need to receive every day anew, afresh, with the empty hands of faith, real righteousness that only comes from Christ. The cross becomes the redeeming power for us as we learn what it means to repent. There's no way around repentance. Verse 27 again. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. But transgressors and sinners will be crushed together. And those who forsake the Lord will come to an end. See, there's a decision before us. Will we repent, be redeemed, or we will rebel and be consumed? God will redeem his people. Aren't you thankful for that? And he wants to redeem you and me. He's paid the price at the cross. The question is, is do we turn in repentance? Even when he leads us into a refining fire. And as I've said over and over again, this is one of the times in church history where the church is being refined by fire. And there's parts of me that are like, okay, God, two years in the fire is enough. I'm totally okay with being out of it. But apparently, it's not time yet. He's got some refining left to do. And so I will repent and I will stay in the fire while he works on me. That's the decision before us. You know, if we decide against repentance, what does it say? It's gonna, we're going to be consumed. Oddly enough, those that don't want to be refined by fire will be toast. The exact thing that they're running from is what's going to get them. If we decide for repentance, we will be redeemed. Verses 29 and 31. Isaiah then begs us to embrace this repentance by showing us what's going to happen once again if we refuse God. The reality that's confronting us is what he's saying here. Surely you will be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired, and you will be embarrassed at the gardens which you have chosen. For you will be like an oak whose leaves fade away, or as a garden that has no water. The strong man will become tender, his work also a spark. Thus they shall both burn together, and there will be none to quench them. These are pretty confrontational verses. And actually, God isn't slapping people around here. He's pressing the point. He's pressing the point because so many times, maybe you catch yourself thinking this. I know every once in a while, I can do it too. We start thinking, you know, it doesn't matter. My decisions, my attitudes, my thoughts, my feelings, do they really make that much of a difference in the scheme of the world? But God is saying, every moment of your life matters. Every moment of your life matters. From conception to natural end. And our choices have lasting, eternal repercussions. That's why God is confronting us with truth. 
If we set the course of our lives by the earthly things that are around us, just because we think it doesn't really matter, we foolishly then start desiring those things more and more, and we choose them more and more, we end up with nothing. The key to these metaphors that we see in 29 and 30 and 31, the strong, his work, the oaks, the gardens, these these metaphors for human strength and and potential and, and preference, the point is, is that our own brilliance and desire will bring the death of us. There are some incredibly bright people out there, but it doesn't get them to heaven. And their work fade away. But repentance, man, it opens up life. It it opens up life in the ways of God. This thing that the world thinks is weak. Because the world, the world, if they're if if you really rip it down to the bottom of what people are are thinking if they're not believers and if they are saying you know i just this whole god thing's baloney what what they're really getting at is um you're weak you're weak if you feel like you have to repent You see that in in leaders all the time, don't you? Instead, let's say someone makes a policy decision and six months later, it is quite obvious that that decision was awful. What, What do leaders tend to do? They tend to actually double down on what was wrong and try to make it right. Hey, I know what we were doing here doesn't work, but I'm going to say it works. No, just repent. It is incredibly freeing to say, I, I was wrong. In the ways of God, the weakness of repentance is how you experience the power of redemption. The weakness of repentance is how we experience the power of redemption. That conviction of sin, repentance, redemption, that is the way to salvation. It's a good way because there is a Redeemer. Whatever draws us to the Redeemer has got to be good, right? New Testament scholar wrote this, No word in the Christian vocabulary deserves to be held more precious than Redeemer. For even more than Savior, it reminds the child of God that his salvation has been purchased at a great and personal cost. For the Lord has himself given himself for our sins in order to deliver us us for and from them I'm going to invite the band to come up here as I close the worship team you may be wondering which way to go you may be far from God you may be a person that actually has repented and understands the power of repentance but you then would also understand the sadness, the horrific sadness of losing purity. Uh, As a person that worked with teenagers, some of the saddest decisions or discussions that I ever had with people were people that had lost their purity in sexual relationships as teenagers. And your heart broke. 
And you know what? Yes, yeah, something's lost. And that, that is tough. And it's hard and it's painful. It's horrific. But there is a Redeemer. There is a Redeemer who says, go and sin no more. But he says, go and sin no more after we do what? We acknowledge sin and repent. Go to him with your honest dealings about your real problems. Go to the Redeemer. Go to the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's stand and sing that right now.